what you said, Ron, was really a segue, is that the word? Yes. Into this morning's message, talking about God using the little things, that is you and me, to do big things, really. Uh, he stoops low to use us who are slow. I like that uh, t-shirt I saw in the Burwood Shopping Centre um, many years ago now when we were living down there. A uh, fellow was wearing this t-shirt. I'm a bomb disposal expert. If you see me running, try to keep up. <laughs> uh, and that's my message for you this morning. Not to keep up with me. I'm, try I'm running to try and keep up with some of you. But uh, this is the race we're living in, the race of faith. We, uh, we're speeding on to the prize of the high calling in Christ Jesus. And we've got some good examples to follow, and one of them, of course, is Abram. Well, he was later called Abraham because he was going to be very prolific in uh, his ability to have children. And he had made a good start of it, and then there was uh, Isaac and Jacob and so many others, the nation of Israel, that followed. And in Genesis 15, the promise was that they were going to be as numerous as the stars in the sky. Well... They are certainly numerous, and it wasn't just the children of Abram either, for that matter. You had uh, Ishmael as well as Isaac, and here we are. What's it, eight billion people in the world today? Not necessarily all because of Abram, uh, but certainly there are many of us here in this particular point in time. I think the uh, population of the earth has doubled a couple of times in the last hundred years. How much longer can we go on? But as long as we've got breath, we must go on for the Lord. And uh, so I'm going to have a look again at uh, Genesis 15. There's the text. The word of the Lord came to Abram in a vis vision. Don't be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. And of course, that is a word spoken to Abram. But uh, the question must be asked, is it also a word that we can take on board and say, these are words for me too. These are words for us. And I think we can. But it does pay to look at the context whenever we're doing Bible study. Uh, and uh, we're not going to do the immediate context or what went immediately before. Uh, another reason why uh, God may well have said to Abram, don't be afraid. If you look at the previous chapter, you'll see that there's quite a story there of uh, uh, conflict. And he could well have been afraid. But I think the context here suggests that he, God is saying, don't be afraid of me. You know, I am God and I am fearful. Sure, but don't be afraid. I am your shield, after all. And I'm your great reward. Let's take that on board. And I want to uh, go back a little bit further than that and uh, talk about the importance of holding on to the examples we read about, even in the book of Genesis. Some will say that it is the book of Genesis after all, and uh, modern science has told us that it can't be right, we're billions of years old, in fact 15 billion years old, I think it's something like 4.5 billion for the age of the earth, or some ludicrous claim like that, with no evidence to back it up, except that they're carbon dating, and radiometric dating and all of that sort of uh, thing uh, points them to the But, unfortunately, the uh, long ages don't do... You upset someone. Yeah, I did, didn't I? Was that me or was that something next door? Let's move on to the next slide, if I can. No, I can't. No, I can't, uh, Kim. Your fault, Kim. The ba this battery must be... Flat. You just don't know how to press the button. Oh, I don't, I don't know where to point it. Where do you, where do you point it? The computer. Up to the projector. No, it's in the computer. No. We well, don't have to have pretty pictures, but they're nice, aren't they? There you go. And we've got them. I, uh, I refer to the uh, tendency, the trend of many in the Christian faith, many church leaders who are questioning the validity of including the Old Testament in our Christianity. And that is because some of these churches have got lots of young people who are going to university and being taught the long ages theory and that evolution 
is the, uh, the way to interpret the world we live in. And Ash Andy, I was going to say Ashley, Andy Stanley is one of them. His uh, father was Charles Stanley, who was a great evangelical who uh, built many, some big churches in the United States. But Andy uh, has rejected his father's approach and has taken the stand that uh, all we need is the words of Jesus. Forget the Old Testament, that's not the foundation of our faith, he says. Except up on the top left hand side, if you read that and take it uh, as Andy's faith statement, uh, you could be forgiven for thinking that he was preaching something else, that the Bible is after all the Word of God. But uh, he's saying if the Bible is the foundation of our faith, it's all or nothing. But uh, subsequent to him saying that, he has discovered or he has decided that no, it is the words of Jesus that is the foundation, that other foundation of our faith. And that's all or nothing. Uh, in fact, he is trying to... Uh, isolated to uh, Jesus and the resurrection, I would tell pastors to get the spotlight off the Bible and back on the resurrection. Well, on the face of it, that might sound all right, but uh, we do need the Bible to find out why we need the resurrection in the first place. We need to know Genesis 1 to 3, that God is the creator and that uh, he created mankind in his image, and it was all good, but then we fell from grace. Human beings disobeyed to the point of death. And we need resurrection, that's for sure. We need to be raised in new life, and that new life can only come through Christ. Now, Andy Stanley has got himself in a bit of a bind, hasn't he, by saying all we need is the words of Jesus. Well, what does the words of Jesus teach us? that, after all, God his Father is the creator of the world. And that he, Jesus, believed that the Old Testament, that is the only scripture that the Jews had in their hands at that time, was the word of God. So let's hold on to the word of God for all we are worth, and certainly for all it's worth. Wasn't that working before? No. I, I just, I I've got some microphones in my ears nowadays. Uh, with my hearing aids, and I can hear myself very plainly, very clearly. Is that better? Yeah. Maybe, that's, maybe that's the problem. No. <laughs> you don't want to hear, you don't want to go too loud. Uh, it would be like Shine at the first introduction. It was all too loud. All right, so you can hear me now? Yep. Good. I, uh, where was I up to? Oh, yes. And in, in fact, let's get back to Genesis as the Word of God. And let's hold on to it as, indeed, the introduction, if you like, to our faith. Is that too much, too, too much echo now? Is it good? Right. Okay. And I quoted last time I spoke a uh, Sarah Coney, who is a professor at a great big Bible college, great big university, in fact. Seattle Pacific University, it sounds grand, Professor of Biblical Studies. Remember I said, and quoting her, the brevity of this text, Genesis 15, belies its theological weight. Hold on to it. It's important. It's strong. In just six verses, we have messages about the reliability and timing of God's promises, lessons about prayer, and a verse so packed with importance that it is quoted in two New Testament passages as a linchpin for understanding the relationship between faith and our life works. So yes, the Bible is important. Genesis is certainly important. Don't uh, tear Genesis out of your Bible. And don't listen to the uh, Andy Stanleys of this world who are trying to uh, uh, remove the Old Testament. For the sake of pacifying evolutionists and their teachings in our universities, in fact, we need to stand up against them and uh, declare that God is God. He is the creator of the world. Yes, now I've, uh, let's get back to the text, and it's Genesis 15, to be sure, but... Uh, 
Abram is the uh, subject of our discussion this morning. And Abram was told, and getting back to Genesis chapter 12, Abram was told to get up and leave his country and go to a place that I am going to show you. Those words were specifically for Abram, and he was told to get up and go. But God uses similar words for you and me. Are you listening to God in your daily life? Maybe he wants you to get up and go. Somebody in this room, at least one person in this room, will recognize this. Uh, this wasn't Abram's chariot, by the way, was it? If only Abram had this kind of tool, this kind of equipment, Lester, wouldn't he go places? He had to trek. It was a thousand kilometers from Ur to Haran, and another thousand kilometers then from Haran down to Canaan, where he ended up living. I don't know. And then, of course, his children, Isaac and Jacob, they both had to go back to Haran, or at least one of them had the servant go back to Haran to pick up a wife for, their, for, for themselves. And uh, that was a trek of a thousand kilometers. Mind you, having said that, I don't think they had to travel through the desert that we see in that part of the world today, the desert that Joan and I experienced when we were living in the Middle East. Reading the Old Testament would suggest that it was much greener, much more fertile in those days. And I mentioned, I think, uh, we picked it up in one of our Genesis studies, Rob, didn't we, Chip, that uh, the king of Edom, I think it was, on the uh, east side of the Jordan River had 30,000 head of cattle that he gave as a gift. That was just a gift. So obviously there was some pretty good grazing land where nowadays there is just desert. The other thing is, and creation ministries postulate this, that after the flood, which was probably 300 years before Abram came along, uh, after the flood, the climate of the world was so changed that there was an ice age in the, uh, well, the Arctic Circle, became, it became ice way down into Europe. And it was just from looking at uh, European archaeology that uh, that is so. So it was a much different Middle East to the one that, uh, that we know today, the one that Abram walked in. It would have been much greener and much more uh, plent uh, plentifully supplied with water. Anyway, I said last time that the word of the Lord has come to us too, just as it came to Abram. And uh, we need to be listening for the word of the Lord. The word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Have you ever had a vision of the Lord? I can't say I have directly. I had a very vivid dream that uh, still sticks in my mind years ago when I was in Burwood of the coming of the Lord. And I would have thought that if that dream was really God's dream, it, might, uh, it should perhaps have been fulfilled by now. But it hasn't, and I have yet to wait for the coming of the Lord. Are you waiting? Are you eagerly anticipating the coming of the Lord? I uh, yes, certainly am. I uh, am enjoying living here on planet Earth, and God is a good provider, isn't he, of all that we need. I think, however, Carolyn, of the graziers further west and, and, and southwest, too, of the, uh, the biggest drought in well, certainly in living memory, probably in a hundred years. We've had some pretty good droughts here in Australia. That's part of our history, but it's getting worse. In fact, I believe that the planet is drying out, heating up and drying out. And it happens so slowly that we hardly are aware of it. So that one, one in a hundred year droughts are probably going to be one in 50, one in 20 year droughts before we know it. Unless, of course, the Lord changes the climate yet again. What is his timetable? I don't know. Let's live as if he's coming today, however. Let's anticipate the coming of the Lord, the soon coming of the Lord. All right, rushing on, came in a vision. I haven't had a vision per se, 
but if you were to look at uh, Genesis 15, you would have to agree that the significance wasn't in what was seen so much as what was heard. And the Lord does speak to us, if not in visions, certainly through the faith that we have in our mind, through our conscience, through our, through our minds, through our sermons, through our Bible reading, through our Bible studies. So many ways the Lord can speak to us. And it may be that one day you will have a vision that will grab your attention. And that's what that's all about. Simply to grab your attention so that you will listen when the Lord speaks to you. Yes, <clears throat> well, hurrying on, I think I must need to, looking at my notes, I need to go on to the next slide. Let's see what it says. No, I went on too far, didn't I? Is that the third slide? All right, we'll leave it. We'll leave it there, Lester, is that all right? Uh, did I explain that this is really Lester's rig? Uh, isn't it amazing? Lester and Wendy have taken this out to Bolland and uh, they've set it up as a camp and uh, they're using it to do some fencing for this 33,000 acre property. I can't imagine a property that big. My brother had one at Morgan, I think that was 18,000. I thought that was huge. Uh, and I grew up on a 2,000 acre property and I did some fencing too, Lester, but only two or 300 meters at a time, and, you know, as a, as a kid. And, uh, yeah, I enjoyed that too. I said to Lester before, I wish I was 20 or 30 years younger so that I'd go out and help him. That'd be my style of living, that's for sure. You take the boy out of the country, but you can't take the country out of the boy. But Abram was asked to go out of the city, the city of Ur. And uh, we find him mentioned in first in Genesis 11. Yes, it's good to get the context right. And... Um, Forget the context of Genesis 14 for a moment. Let's go right back and uh, find Abram at the beginning. Probably about 300 years or so from memory. I didn't look it up after the flood. And by yeah, now the earth was being populated again. Remember the Tower of Babel sits somewhere in that 300 year period. And uh, God scattered people to the far corners of the world. So that we got, had the Incas over in America and we had the, uh, the uh, African tribes in Africa and so forth. The uh, people spread out according to their descendancy, whether it was Shem, Ham or Japheth. And then we come eventually to a guy called Terah. I think I will put that next slide on now. There he is, Terah at the top of the pile at the top of the tree, if you like. I think you'll find him in Genesis 11, verse 27 or so. Yes, there he is. Terah, in verse 26, was 17 years old, and by that time he had three sons, Abram, Nahor, and Haran. It's interesting and it's a little bit frustrating, a little bit uh, sexist, I suppose, reading the Old Testament. It only talks about the males. Every now and again, a female descendant is mentioned. Remember Dina, a little bit later on, a few chapters further on, that one of the brothers, uh, of, uh, one of the sisters of, uh, uh, of uh, Jacob's children. But here we've got uh, one that is mentioned a few verses further down, and that is Sarai. And that word means princess. Well, that's a nice name for a girl, isn't it? Uh, Abram's sister, Sarah, he married her. Well, she was only a half-sister. We read it further, a few chapters further on in Genesis. So there's uh, uh, Abram in his context. Abram, Nahor, and Haran. It would suggest, however, reading back in the scripture, that uh, probably that's not the order in which they were born. I think it was probably uh, uh, Haran, Nahor, and Abram, if you want to put them in chronological order. And uh, Haran, in fact, died young, relatively young. And uh, he had a son called Lot. Remember Lot? And uh, his lot in life was to follow after his uncle Abram. And he went with Abram wherever Abram went. And uh, then it, 
it tells us even in verse 30 of that same chapter that Sarai was barren. She couldn't have children. Yeah. But eventually she did, of course, and the rest is history. Uh, it takes us to Genesis 19, I think, before we find that it, uh, the promise of God began to work itself out. We need to be very patient when it comes to God, don't we? Particularly us who are 20th, 21st century Australians, because we've got everything, you know, just go down to the show. This morning I was looking in the fridge and we were down to that much milk and we had visitors in the house and they were keen on having some wheat picks. And uh, I just went down to the shop and bought some more. How about that? I think if I was out of Gordonbrook and they came 20 kilometres out of town, I wouldn't have been able to do that. We would have had to have toast or something else. And, uh, but nowadays, we, we hardly know we're alive. Just imagine being in Ur of the Chaldeans and having to, to uh, tramp a thousand kilometres northeast to uh, find a place to live and then being asked to go again a thousand kilometers south west to Canaan. But Abram did it. He, was, uh, he had an ear for the Lord and uh, he was obedient to that uh, word from the Lord. In fact, the point that I want to leave with you as we uh, head out this morning is that Abram was indeed obedient. So much so that uh, that obedient faith was the faith that God considered righteousness. A lot of unrighteousness in human beings, a lot of unrighteousness in Abram. But he believed God, he trusted God, and God counted that righteousness for Abram. Kim is starting to tell me that time is nearly up. Is that right, Kim? No, you said you and uh, uh, I just want to finish up by saying that as Abram was called to be a leader in God's economy, and he was a very obedient leader, and look at the consequences, so he is calling us, each one of us, to be leaders. This is the segue, Ron was talking about it, segue in the... Uh, obedient rather in the little things, hey? Just uh, sending that card of encouragement to somebody, just speaking a word for the Lord. I like these texts of the New Testament. There could be many more. I'll just leave you with these. Matthew chapter 5, verse 13 and 14. We are salt and light. If we are shining like stars in this crooked generation, if we are salt and light, if we are letting our faith in the word nourish us, then we will be salt and light and we will uh, see fruit. We will be the leaders God has called us to be. Yes, it's Philippians 2 verse 15, isn't it? Where we are to shine like stars in this crooked generation. What are those two texts? Matthew 5, 13 and 14, salt and light, and Philippians 2, 15, we're to shine like stars in a crooked generation. 2 Corinthians talks a lot about light as well and fragrance. Uh, we don't have to put our uh, anti-deodorant our deodorant on, do we? Because we are the fragrance of Christ to those we meet if we're living out our faith. It was encouraging to me at my father's graveside as we were burying him that one of my old schoolmates came up to him came up to me and said I wish I had what you've got we had faith Joan and I had faith to go even further than what Abram did although we had planes to do it in we flew all the way to Lebanon to be missionaries and that sort of caught the attention of this old schoolmate and he since has given his life to the Lord too 2 Corinthians 4 uh, is a good one to talk about light. And uh, then in the very next chapter, chapter 5, verse 20, we are ambassadors 
Uh, I've had, had a few encounters with ambassadors and stayed in the ambassador's residence overnight. don't think I ever met the ambassador. We stayed uh, there overnight while we were waiting for transport to take us out to the Oasis Hospital when we were beginning our missionary career in the Arabian Gulf. But ambassadors, well, they live the high life uh, in representing the boss, the, uh, the country from which they come, and we too, in God's economy, are well blessed by the Lord as ambassadors for Christ. He likes us because we, well, he considers us beautiful. How beautiful are the feet of him who brings good news. So we are called to be leaders as Abram was, maybe in a smaller capacity, maybe in a bigger capacity, I don't know, but let's be leaders by the way we let our light shine, by the way we uh, let the salt of our characters change everything around us. Yes, amen. Lord God, help us to be this kind of leader in our little communities, whether it be Burke and Gary or uh, uh, the Pumiston Passage or Moray Field or Caboolture or Alimba or um, that place I can't even think of the name of where Rob and May live. Where you I got to know Rob, yeah. <coughs> Wherever we are, Lord God, help us to be the leaders you want us to be. Amen. Thank you. Amen.